Hi everyone, welcome to Art and Talk. Art and Talk is an online interviewing platform for artists to share their art, creativity, and passion. We embrace all the arts to bring you diverse and quality interviews to watch and be inspired by. So we bring you the traditional artists and we also bring the spiritual artists on board Art and Talk. We're so grateful that you've checked in with us today. Our guest artist today is a photographer, and we're going to be looking at some of his photography and exploring what that's all about. We'd also like to invite you to join us on social media. Please be a part of our Art and Talk YouTube channel, and also please um, join us on our Facebook page as well. Please subscribe, like, and share. We appreciate your support. If you are an artist and you're watching this and you'd like to be interviewed on Art and Talk, just send an email to viewoftheartist at gmail.com and we'll get back to you with scheduling and information. Thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to watch Art and Talk. We certainly appreciate it. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk, and I'd like to welcome our guest artist, photographer, Paul McDermott. Hi, Paul, welcome. Hi, Leslie Sue. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate this opportunity. Oh, awesome. You know what? I can't wait to find out all about your photography and, you know, what it's all about. I, you know, had a, a, a fun sneak peek and what I see is just amazing. So um, why don't you just start off and, and share a little bit about um, your um, kind of beginnings of, of photography and, and kind of give us a little hint and then we'll, we'll look into some of your images. Okay. All right. Great. Um, yeah. So I, I guess basically uh, I, I always was interested in the arts and I always enjoyed drawing it. and I was always fantastic at drawing you know I was really really great but by the time I turned 13 I was drawing at the same skill level I hadn't really advanced um, I wasn't very good so um, photography was another avenue another way for me to be able to express myself um, when I was 14 I went to a local lab and um, I basically begged them for a job um, I really wanted to learn more about photography I figured the best way to do it was to immerse myself in the environment so I uh, went to a local lab. They said, we can't hire you. You're too young. I said, yes, you can. I'll find a way. So I went. I found all the paperwork. I, I dragged my dad in. He's like, kids motivated. Just hire him already. So they ended up hiring me. By the time I was 16, I was able to run the lab by myself. Um, ended up doing photography all throughout high school, learning different processes, um, starting with film, uh, working with Polaroids, working with uh, transparency. Um, you know, kind of the full gamut, went to college for photography. Um, while I was there, I started doing more more commercial photography as well, uh, just to be able to support my college career. I paid for college myself, so uh, it ended up being a great way for me to be able to make some money on the side. Um, ended up being kind of conflicting with a lot of people I went to school with, but I was still passionate about it. I wanted to be a photographer full time. Uh, I'm one of probably two people in my class from college that actually do photography at this point. And uh, I ended up having a, a very great career in photography, uh, working for a high-end portrait studio, um, ended up winning some international awards with them, um, working for the top wedding photography studio in the world. Uh, they're based here in South Florida, which, you know, funny enough, but I worked with them for a couple of years. And I was the only photographer with them who's not a family member for much of the time I was there. And um, then when I went in, into business for myself, I realized the gap um, between you know, all the different photographic skills and the capacity for people to be able to, to build rapport, make people feel comfortable and, and make look their, uh, no matter what the circumstances are. So I ended up doing a lot of corporate photography and commercial photography for people that felt really uncomfortable in front of the camera um, and up doing very, very well with that. And then the pandemic hit and I really had to do my soul searching. And I said, you know, I really just want to sell my fine art and sell all my travel photography and be doing the things that I'm really passionate about. Um, so I ended up opening up a small gallery space and that's that's where I am now. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you really run the gamut from almost every genre of photography. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious, Paul, um, before we start to look at um, one of your images, um, at 14, so quite young, you already were on this kind of like um, itinerary. You had this trajectory of like, wow, I'm, I'm really into photography as a, as a um, exploration of my own you know, personal expression. I'm, I'm curious though, um, Paul, what were, as you were studying uh, photography um, initially early on, what were some areas that were a little hard for you 
to kind of master? And then what areas did you kind of breeze through? Can you kind of just give us a, a little mini scoop into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> what I've always struggled with is kind of being conceptual photographer. Um, I am very much like, I, I love what I see. I love what I experience in life. And that was one of the biggest, most conflicting things when I was in college is I would shoot the full, you know, the full gamut of everything. And I, and I loved to be able to um, go photograph a wedding and then go photograph in nature. And then the moment that you see two birds interacting and going in for like a, a little kiss and um, everything, you know, and just sitting there and people watching and doing like street photography. Um, and for me, it was just, it was a way to experience life. Um, one of the things that I didn't realize was I, I used photography as a meditation tool. Uh, it helped me get all my attention out and get out of my head. So for me, that was really about the process. And it was difficult for me to go deeper before I realized that that was actually the depth of what it was. So that, that was probably the most conflicting thing was making something into something conceptual because it was not based in, um, it was not rooted in, in, you know, in my head. It was something that was rooted in the experience of life. Um, and sorry, I forget what the second part of the question was. Mm -hmm. um, well, just um, what were the areas that were um, difficult? Would you kind of elaborated on that, you know, when you were, you know, getting kind of going into photography? And then what kind of areas did you just kind of like breeze through? Like, you know, like the camera is just an extension of you, you know, understanding the camera, mm -hmm. understanding light. What things were like easy for you to kind of like, you know, just initially, you know, get a full understanding about? Yeah, so I'm a very technical person. So it was very easy for me to local stuff the type of person that once I get it, something clicks us, I know it so um, it was fairly easy for me to start mastering the technical and then start applying it um, you know there's lots of amazing photographers out there who they, they feel into it and they just like they know they know what's good they, they can understand and, and feel the light um, I had to train myself to feel it you know so there's some of the amazing people that I work with uh, some some of my photographers on my team, you know, they're I, I say they're even more talented than I am um, because they just have it within their heart where they just like they're able to get out there and just shoot and make everything look great. Um, whereas I had to train myself in all those little technical things and understand it to be able to to translate it into the visual experience that I want to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great expression because really photography is is that beautiful marriage, wouldn't you say, Paul, of like the whole you know, technical aspects, getting all that right. And then also the, the feel, as you said as well, like, you know, with the light and the feel of the moment and, and getting all those different components to, you know, really create a, a work of art or, a, you know, a great photograph. Did, did you get yes. all that? Oh, okay. So, um, you broke up a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you broke up a little bit there, but um, it will, Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, uh, basically it was just like how photography is a real marriage of, of the technical and, and the creative aspects, kind of like combining those two. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So actually my other career path that I was considering was being an architect. Oh. So, I mean, it's no, it's, it's no surprise that it's something very technical, very uh, geometric, you know, you're looking at shapes, you're looking at the way the spaces interact with each other, with the form, form and space and, um, you know, so it is very, very technical. And then how the emotion that gets brought out and what you feel. Um, what I love about photography is that you're working with life. You know, it's, you're not creating life, you're working with life and just capturing what's before you. And that's one of the magical things about it is that, you know, getting to commemorate a moment that will never happen again. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's so well said. Um, Paul, would you like to go ahead and kind of jump into your first image and, and we'll have you discuss that? Okay, all right, sure, give me a moment sure. and we'll pull this up. All right. All right. So this, uh, this image is very, uh, very special to me. Um, this is probably one of my favorite captures that I've ever made. And uh, it may be more meaningful to me than to anybody else, but uh, to me, it's still just very special for what it represents. Um, I mean, there's just uh, there's just so much that happened in this moment. So, in 2019, I started showing my work, and in 2020, I took a five-week vacation in um, 
actually, I mean, it wasn't quite a vacation. It was a, f- a five week expedition, photographic expedition in Australia with my father um, to, to be able to explore and create a new body of work. I had bought a new camera just before the trip to really be deliberate about going in with the perspective of being an artist. Um, so I, I bought a Hasselblad, which is the best of the best. It's a medium format sensor, um, 50 megapixels. And the, you know, and the, the tonal qualities that you get out of that camera um, are just phenomenal. And you know, I, I always believe that I could use a point and shoot. I could use anything. You give me a disposable camera and I'll still be able to make beautiful work with it. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's like, no matter how good of a driver you are, if you're in an old Ford Taurus versus a Ferrari, you can still do a lot better with a Ferrari if you know how to use it. So um, basically I bought the Ferrari and I got to go to Australia and use it. And um, we weren't sure if we were gonna be able to make it on the trip. So the uh, the forest fires were, were running rampant there. And um, you know everything, everything was looking like we weren't gonna be able to go there because much of the areas that we're going to be exploring were on fire at the time. And um, it was probably just within a week of the forest fire starting to die down uh, that we ended up getting on the plane and going to Australia. And this was just a few days into the trip where um, I had all this judgment and I was uh, I was very personally upset about the forest fires and the way that, um, that I feel like we are stewards of the planets um, the same way that the aboriginals encourage, you know, that we are stewards of the planet and we are the caretakers of this earth. And to see that we had, uh, um, we hadn't done a good job in our role, in our position to, of doing that. And that's one of the reasons that things were so chaotic and, uh, and that we did have the fires running, um, covering as much ground as they did, uh, which was very unfortunate. But if Aboriginals have a practice called back burning and they will they will frequently go and uh, do controlled burns to allow for forest fires like what we experienced not to happen. Uh, we had the same thing happen in California as well. And it's a lot of the old practices that we just have kind of given up on um, letting nature, we want nature to thrive, but we also forget about the aspect of destruction and how important destruction is, uh, how important death is. And from death comes new, comes new birth. Uh, so this to me, it's like, it represents the rise of the Phoenix, the rise of new growth, uh, the rise of new opportunity. Also for me at the time in my life, this is the birth of my new career uh, to, as a fine art photographer, rather than being just a corporate photographer. And everything about this trip was very deliberate about that. And in this moment, I recognize that, you know, it's like everything constant, the constant movement, you know, the movement of the green, the movement of the new growth, but just seeing that just a week prior that this was, this was all engulfed in flames and the remnants of that, but then the beauty that's able to come because of it. So that's, uh, that's why this, this picture in particular is, is, you know, very heartfelt to me. Um, and I, I liked it as an opening image because I thought it allowed for the, um, for the expansion of everything else, just recognizing the, you know, the constant aspect of growth and the way that the cycles of the planet and the cycles of life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's a really interesting insight into this. I'm going to stop the screen share for just a, a moment, Paul. Sure thing. Okay, so that was that was amazing. So that what was going on um, with the fires and whatnot, and, and the whole a death and rebirth was not only symbolic of that area, but it was symbolic of you and a turning point, a new birth, um, a new life um, in your photography, you know, which overlaps into other areas. So that was a really significant um, hallmark experience. Yes. And then yes. captured in an and, image. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. So, so that image represents a lot to me. Um, and you know, f- funny enough, we when we got home, uh, everything was already happening happening with uh, with COVID, and we got home, and within a week we were back on lockdown. So, um, you know, that also being just that it was one of those forces that kind of kept me going through the year, just knowing that with all the destruction that we were experiencing. Um, that I knew there'd be something more beautiful on the other side. Wow. So that really was like inspiring and also a source of hope. And what I find interesting is in that moment, what it sounded like you were actually 
you know, experience it. Like it all came together. Cause sometimes things are in hindsight and we're like, you can kind of look back and you're like, oh, I, I get that now. And then sometimes it happens in the moment. And as you were saying, photography is so like, you know, being in the moment along with, with all the, you know, other aspects. So I, I just found that whole thing really, really fascinating and very poetic and also very touching and, and obviously, you know, important for you and, and your career and, and your life and your passion. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes. Yeah. So let's go ahead, if that's all right, and let's go to um, the next image. Give me a moment. I'll pull that right up. Okay. <laughs> so this image is, uh, is definitely the fan favorite. So uh, actually, why don't we start with what this brings up for you? What feelings are you evoking from this well, image? Uh, for me, uh, what comes up, uh, first of all, I think is um, majestic beauty, um, you know, winter cold, so it's, you know, seasonal and, and kind of going back to what you touched upon the, the cycles of, of nature. Um, you know, the great spirit, uh, it, I think it evokes a lot and I, um, I love the composition. I mean, first of all, it, it's centered. So it has like this, this even feel and the, the background is like very transcendent and it's there, but it isn't. So we focus on the, the subject. Um, and it's, it's like, to me, it's like there and I recognize, you know, what it is, but it, but it's also like not there. It has that like there, but dreamy kind of feel. That's, that's what, what I'm getting from it. And it's like, I don't know, like a breathing. What, what's, what was going on with this um, when you created it? Well, I mean, exactly all those things. Oh, you know, that okay. was beautifully said. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it was just a, I th I, less than you said, that it was there and it was not there. And I love that. That's, that's just the most beautiful way to put it. Um, you know, so just, uh, just being so present that you're in nothingness. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, you know, I have a lot of experiences like this when I'm traveling and I get to interact with animals. Um, and it's, it's in that space of just synchronicity. Mm, yeah. You know, so, so this was one of those profound moments where it just like, it just happened. Um, I was driving along. Um, we were in Iceland. I was just in, once again, another trip with my father. Uh, my dad hadn't traveled much when he was younger. So um, as an adult, you know, we become... I mean, we've always been very close friends, but we're best friends and to have the ability to travel with each other and experience the world um, and see the joy that he gets to experience from something that he never thought he'd be able to do has been just amazing. Um, but we were driving along and and uh, we'd gone there in March. The mission was to see the, the Northern Lights. And this was midday and this was, it was as bright as it was gonna be because we were just cloaked in snow everywhere. And um, I just saw this horse in this white landscape, you know, just bl almost blending in. Um, and uh, I, I pulled over on the side of the road. I think I actually just parked in the middle of the road because, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere. We hadn't seen any other cars in probably about three or four hours. Um, so I just stopped and got out and, and walked up to this horse and he walked right up to me. And just this, mo this moment of pause uh, this moment of just being there with each other, um, you know, I, I didn't have to communicate anything. He just kind of knew that I wanted to be able to create this image and uh, hung out for a second. And then once he knew that the interaction was complete, he just left and it was done. Mm, wow. So beautiful. And, and what an amazing moment. Um, I'm wondering, Paul, how close were you? Um, approximately uh, to the horse when you took the photo? So I was just a few feet away from him. Mm. Yeah, I actually had taken a selfie where he was like gnawing on my jacket and, you know, it was, uh, it was you know, he was fearless and was curious. Uh, you know, we, we think that we're very curious creatures, but really I, I find that most of the animal world is just as curious as we are. And if we adjust our energy level that we're not meeting something with fear or aggression, um, then most animals are willing to interact with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's absolutely exquisite. I would love to have this like super, super, you know, enlarged on a wall. It, it's really magnificent. Yeah, I sold the last one I had in stock. So I'm about to order another one as big as possible, probably about five feet across for to have here at the gallery. Oh, oh, wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next one unless there was anything else you wanted to share about this. No, no, I'm very big on the viewer experience. This is uh, very different for me to have to share my own experience like this. Normally I get to story tell a little bit, mm. um, but I, I love being able to hear what you hear about what you see in it first and then being able to feel into the way that you feel about it. Mm -hmm. All right, so let, let's go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, whoa. <laughs> All right. I, do you want me to elaborate first? Or if, if you'd like, or I can go ahead and talk. Oh, I'll let you go ahead, please. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Yeah, so uh, this shot was another capture in Australia. And uh, it was one of my missions to be able to dive with the Great Whites. So I was in a cage. Um, but what was so, was so profound about this experience was just how poignant the sharks are and how powerful they are and you know it's, it's kind of like like the way i like to put it is you don't a mob boss doesn't walk into a room and start shooting everybody a mob boss knows how, how powerful he is and he knows that nobody's going to mess with him and that's the way i felt about the sharks they it, some people you know were scared even though we were in the cage some people on the boat had a little bit of a more fearful experience but i was like this this shark has zero real interest in us because one we're not its food but two it knows that if it wants to it could destroy us instantly and um we ended up having having three sharks with us for the entire day um while we were having the the cage diving experience um i was first in the water i think i was last hour maybe maybe i was second in the water but got in first thing as soon as i was allowed to and um spent as much time being able to to be in their presence and um, I had a few different amazing shots. This one I just loved with the reflection that you have at the top, um, the delicate nature of it. This is one that I actually have in exhibit right now, um, a large piece, a five foot across uh, image of, of the shark. Um, yeah, and uh, it's just very, very profound. Um, so obviously I do underwater photography uh, mm -hmm. and that's become a big part of my life. Um, you know, getting underwater where it's just, it's quiet and there's so much stillness. And, you know, just being able to be with such amazing creatures. Mm -hmm. So you were in a cage photographing this. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you first saw the shark, um, did you take a moment to just like, you know, observe and take it in? Or, or was it like, okay, there's the shark, you know, getting my, getting your camera up and, and, and shooting like, like what were like the, the first couple of, of moments? Like take us like under the water and okay, now you see the shark, you have your equipment, you're in the cage and it's just about to start. What, how did that play out for you? I think I first saw the shark um, swimming at a distance and below us. And um, it may have been somebody else that was in the cage that uh, had gotten my attention because uh, there were other fish around as well. Um, so I think I was distracted taking photos in the ocean and somebody actually tapped me on the shoulder and pointed out there's a shark uh, below the cage, um, probably about 100 feet away. Uh, what blew me away was the, the clarity that we had in the water, just being able to look down. And um, I have some fun shots where the shark could end up literally coming right below the cage and with my feet and the shark right there. Um, but I was, uh, I was thrilled. I was excited. Um, they had actually called me about two weeks before this trip and they said, Hey, we haven't been seeing any sharks. So we're just calling you to let you know if you want to cancel, we understand. And, um, you know, I was like, no, I, I'm pretty sure this experience is going to work out for me. Mm. So I'm staying fully committed. And, uh, they said that they hadn't had a day like that all season. And, um, you know, to consistently have sharks coming around all day, the way that they did, uh, is a very rare experience. So. Mm -hmm. The good fortune was smiling. Sorry? The good fortune was smiling. 
Oh, yes. Yes, it was. And the light on the shark, Paul, is just beautiful. Thank you. And I wish I could say I had some control over that, but that was just all you know, natural light, you know, just uh, God's grace. Mm. And what was your decision making process to have this in black and white? Mm. Uh, I think that it was really the texture. So I love this image and it looks great in color as well, but I felt like it added so much texture and grit by putting it into black and white. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I love about black and white and um, probably my, my print vendors hate me for it is I, I love the playing around with density and how particular you can get about the density of your print. Um, so they actually had to redo this for me. They sent me a print and it looked, it looked good. Um, but I was like, I think that this is probably about 10% light. And they went and they said, yes, our autocorrect made it 10% lighter. And I said, okay, send me a, send me a better version of this. And they did. And um, looked much better. Looked it looked what my expectations were, um, but the particulars of like how you know I, I love the looking at the the bottom and just the contrast you see between the shark's belly and the water behind them, and then the just that that texture that you have of the shark, but even in the reflection and and um, the glare on the top, um, you just have so much so much. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, but just all that texture that's within it that I feel like the black and white pulls out even more and the color almost acted as a distraction to those elements. Mm, yes, yes, I see that. And also there's um, an amazing sense of, you know, stillness, you know, but there's also an amazing sense of, mm -hmm. of movement. Like you really feel like, the movement of the shark and also the slowness as well. And then of course in the, like you said, like the texture and the movement, um, you know, of the water towards the top and then kind of like the patterns on the shark. But I definitely feel a sense of like, like movement coming through, which I think is like a, you know, and, and is still work is, is, you know, quite a, a feat to capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was uh, there's so many different elements that kind of helped with that. Um, you know, like the the first image, we're able to create movement by having the blur. Um, this one, the movement also comes from uh, you know the, yeah, the slight um, sunbeams that you can see coming through, and the directionality of them, mm -hmm. um, and the subtlety of that actually helps it gives that illusion of it moving forward with it and coming towards us. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, did you have any fear when you, it doesn't sound like it, but you know, obviously you were in the cage and you know, you knew what, you know, there, that there were going to be sharks. You wanted them to, to be sharks so you could photograph them, but the, the fear just kind of became absent in, in the beauty of, of the moment and, and the potential to photograph them. Would, it, would that be kind of correct? Yes. And, uh, all my friends tell me I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I love diving with sharks. I, I love not yet, even not in a cage. Um, I'm kind of fearless when it comes to certain things. Uh, I actually had an experience where it was my completely my fault. I ended up antagonizing a shark to the point where he turned on me while I was in the Bahamas trying to get a better photo. And um, after that, I just had this moment of clarity. I'm like, oh, this is this is not how I'm going to die. You know, I, I'm completely safe. I'm not going to be harmed by any sharks. Um, and I just knew I was safe. And um, You know, ever since then, I've taken more photo arcs been able to have better and better interactions with them because my little bit of fear that I had previously is kind mm -hmm. of dissolved. And I'm able to just be present with them rather than uh, have the, um, the middle of the hijack of, of having that fear and wanting to fight or flight. So. Right, right. Yeah, beautifully said. So it was, is your, your whole mindset. Um, would you like to share anything else about this one, Paul, before we move to the next image? Um, there's nothing that's nothing that's coming up for me right now so okay all up. right very good let's go to the next one okay so uh, this image is actually uh pretty local um this was taken actually uh during the pandemic and this is in key largo uh this is the spiegel grove uh it's one of the most sought after uh recreational rec dives in the world um, I believe it's the second largest recreational wreck uh, 
in the world as well. I believe I read that somewhere. Um, it may have been a while ago, so I don't know if that fact has changed or not. Um, being local, I've dove it several times. I, you know, obviously I'm an avid scuba diver and, and water rat. Um, and most, almost every time you have a, you have a current that's kind of pulling you and pushing you along the side of the boat. Um, so this ended up being a beautiful, amazing chamber of commerce day. There was no current whatsoever. The visibility was a couple hundred feet. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, I could not have asked for a better day and somebody had replaced the flag. So every year, whenever I went to it, you know, there was always a raggedy old flag there and somebody had replaced it. And to be able to, to dive on it and um, be able to finally make this capture you know, the way I've been wanting to for, for years was really amazing moment. Uh, this was also my wife's first time diving it. So it ended up just being a magical combination of, of everything, um, you know, for just a, an absolutely amazing experience. And, you know, one of the things that I feel like this would, was very, uh, with everything that's been going on in our country, you know, though I feel like everybody still loves this country and loves the flag we may end up having our own issues with each other but you know everybody's here and the way that everybody has our differences we wouldn't be able to celebrate or even argue about our differences if we weren't here so it's something really beautiful and you know it means very different things different people depending on where they are in their lives and what their feelings are in the political landscape um but no matter what, it's something that everybody's been ident able to identify with one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, also, Paul, the way that the, the flag is, is the, the movement of it, you know, I think that, you know, what a great, great capture along with, you know, the, the other compositional aspects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know they said there was no current, but there must have been obviously some little bit of current to keep the flag moving that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was so minimal that it was easy to be able to navigate the entire boat. So. Right, right. And how meaningful, you know, you know, because it was, you know, shot during the pandemic and all that you've elaborated on. And, you know, putting the, the American flag as like the focal point. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share. Okay. Wow, this is a beautiful photography. And we've only... Um, had a, a just like a little sneak peek and uh, so Paul you do pretty much um, as we you know mentioned in the beginning almost every genre you know you have your nature photography that you know, we've taken a look at whether it's a landscape or animals uh, you do weddings you do the uh, you know traditional portraits um, you know uh, street scenes um, you know pretty much a, a whole variety is there anything that you haven't photographed that um, is like on your agenda um, or maybe a, a recreation of something you photograph but you want to express it in a different way? Mm. Always. <laughs> there's a, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that I would love to, to either explore or re-explore. Um, there's so much of the world that I haven't seen and that I haven't touched. And uh, even when I look through my archives and I see some of the beautiful places that I have been, I'm like, wow, it's like with, how far along I'd be able to take completely different photographs of the same exact thing. Now, um, I had that experience with Iceland because Iceland was somewhere that was a return trip for me. Um, and just seeing where my, my, you know, it's like I've gotten to be uh, more advanced technically. Um, I've had more greater ability to, um, to be able to be present and to be able to see new images, new opportunities. Um, so I don't do as much of the weddings and the social stuff anymore. Um, I am pick and choose my corporate clients uh, because I know if I focus all my attention there, then that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, and, you know, as soon as the world opens back up, I, I know I'll be exploring and, and going to new domains. Um, but, but being stuck at home has been a fun exploration of, of other things, the things I care about. This, uh, this was actually taken... Uh, during the pandemic as well, the shot over my shoulder. Um, that was 
you know, taken on a Florida beach um, as well as that one. But I don't think that was taken during the pandemic, but I've got, you know, I was creating new work and having to re-inspire myself in different ways rather than being about being somewhere, um, being able to, to, to inspire myself and be inspired by just uh, what was normally mundane uh, and something I'm so used to and so familiar with. Um, so yes, I want to see and do it all. I want to see and explore everywhere. Um, there's always new projects to be able to, to do. Uh, but I guess I can't really say there's any one thing in particular. Um, I've had so many trips canceled, you know, because of, you know, coronavirus that, um, I'm almost afraid to say that I want that there's anything I specifically want or, or even talk about my upcoming trips just in case anything happens again. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I just like to touch upon the, um, the the pandemic has sort of brought out in you, Paul, um, mm -hmm. sort of like, as you said, um, inspiration in what you uh, saw prior to as the mundane. So it was kind of like you couldn't go anywhere. Uh, so you had to kind of find inspiration from your environment, from from what's around you. That That's correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, so a lot of the things that I was going to say a lot of the things that, that like I take for granted as well, you know, so it's like, I have a beautiful yard and uh, I, you know, it's like, I was, it was not a bad area to be able to hang out and just be able to relax in my pool and go on little nature walks in my backyard. I don't have a big backyard, but we, we have, you know, an amazing, you know, an amazing friend who takes care of our garden. And she did a phenomenal job. So I got to Murphy House and allowed to go out to parks and, and stuff at a certain point in time. Um, and it, it was amazing. So I, I basically, I got to rekindle a lot of gratitude for a lot of those things that I do normally take for granted as well. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm just wondering when you photograph something and um, have you had the experience of like, you know, let's say you just shot ho however many you do in, in a certain scene. Um, I am just going to, can you shoot out a number, like, for example, with, with the horse, um, or that may have, that was kind of like momentary, but like, what is like an average amount that, that you would shoot? And then you select the ones that, you know, you want to kind of develop and, and present and edit and whatnot. It depends on what I'm photographing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of things are just like a, one instantaneous moment. Um, you know, what comes to mind is, is like the street photography, which I love. Like when I travel around Europe, it's one of my favorite things to do. I've been known to sit in a park all afternoon and just sit there and watch people interact. And, you know, you, you, you see these moments happening and you almost have to preempt them. And, you know, all it takes is one shot. You know, I, you can't take five photos of something that happens just, you know, in, a hundredth of a second mm -hmm. so you need to be able to capture it exactly then and there mm -hmm. um other times you know if i if i'm traveling to national parks i could take a few hundred photos photographing a sunset or a sunrise um and you know i just take sometimes i'll take you know about eight different photos in a row and be able to pan my camera from one side to the other to be able to composite it later in a bigger panoramic also give me more resolution for me to be able to blow it, blow it up to a larger size. Um, so I can take eight photos, but also be putting them into, a, I can uh, also cause them with a, a more diverse dynamic range. Um, our eye can see thousands of colors. The camera can only see about 10, you know, so it's like, that's a lot of limitation. So to be able to, to, so you can basically stack images and compress the the density into the histogram. Um, it's speaking a little bit more technically, but basically you take you take the highlights, you can take the dark tones, and you expose them separately and bring them back together. So doing that with you know with one shot, I could take twenty four photos for that one image, mm -hmm. um, and then decide that that's doesn't work because what happens in five minutes ends up being more beautiful light, and I actually want to use that image instead. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so. right. You bring so much to photography, Paul. I mean, you have a great wealth of, of knowledge of the technical aspects, but yet you also bring this other part, like you keep saying the word presence, which is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring, you know, your presence and just being in the moment and just kind of like allowing that magic to happen and kind of stepping back and being an observer. So you bring so much to photography. Um, but what I was interested in getting at um, also is, um, so sometimes when you're taking a shot, like, can you just feel it? Like, it was like, you're like, yes, that that's it. Like, you know, you're going to get back in your studio. And that was like, wham, bam. And then other times how you taken a photograph and it's just been like, okay, you know, like maybe it was a little bit more neutral. And then you got back in your studio and you were like, oh my gosh, wow, nailed it. That is really, you maybe like you saw it in another, in another perspective, Has anything of that come to play? Yes, yes. Uh, I was actually looking around to see if I had one of those images in here. Uh, normally, when I take a photo, I know I nailed it, you know, because normally I'm looking at all the different elements and I'm like, this is going to make that image that I know is going to be like, you know, the money shot. Um, and normally all the elements, I, I align them, I make sure all the technical is perfect. Um, but then there's certain moments that like I've got, I have no idea. So uh, one of the photos that I won award for last year actually was, um, a, a school of fish, a school of grunts. And uh, there was a moment where the entire school turned and there was one fish um, that that hadn't turned yet. And so we had the one fish who's right here and all the other fish around him were turned sideways. And there was this beautiful circle of space around him where you just see the water behind and that gap with the one fish looking, looking almost seemingly looking at the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and that I had no idea I have even gotten that because I was in the mix of photographing these fish right when it was happening until I was looking through the photos later. And then I was like, wow, this is actually a great shot. Um, oftentimes, you know, even if I do get shots like that, um, you know, it's, it's difficult for um, uh, interesting things, which is actually a little bit different now than it used to be, but um, with the DSLR, um, with an SLR, it's a single lens reflex. So what, what would happen is the mirror will go, you're looking through through a mirror on top of the camera, through the, through the eyepiece, there's a mirror that goes to a mirror that shows you exactly what's gonna be going through your lens. And if, when the mirror goes up, you can't see anymore because it's blocking the vision from the eyepiece. So, the technical thing is if you if you miss the moment you capture the moment which is just kind of like a fun plan photography now with uh with the way that we have the mirrorless and people are using their cell phones we don't have that same sort of experience anymore um with the aspect of of missing the moment and knowing that you got the shot because you missed it um but now it's just about the magic of whether or not you got the shot uh i'm not a i mean there's there's certain photographers that are uh i say spray and pray you know, so they go and they snap, 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 and they see if they've got something really great later. I like to orient myself for the better images that I think I'm going to get. But, you know, then like, like I said, sometimes I am very pleasantly surprised. And oftentimes those become my favorite images because I just didn't know that I was, um, I was getting something so magical. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more minutes, Paul. Um, before we wrap up the show, is there anything about your ph photographic journey that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to share with us? Mm. Yeah, there's something uh, that, uh, that I feel is very important that I feel like has gotten kind of lost um, in, in the craft, which is the idea of printmaking. And, uh, you know, like I was talking about the printmaking before I was talking about the, the shark photo and how I had them redo it because the density was off by 10%, which is minimal, but, you know, it, it ends up being a significant difference when you look at the print and you, you address the technical and, um, you know, I love, I love the technical aspects of photography. And one of the things that I disliked about conceptual conceptualism is that it almost discounts the, the need for technical and, my theory is if we can bring that technical element into conceptual work, then that's really where some magic can happen. That's where things get really beautiful. You know, so I tend to work with what's readily available. And then the, the, the concept, as you've seen with all the different pieces that we've discussed, ends up being something that comes after the work rather than in creation of the work. 
but um definitely very big on the on the printmaking and i think that people need to uh need to give a little bit more attention to to that in general because i've seen some of the most beautiful pieces of work that are printed horribly um and then it also just gives such a deliberate nature to what you're creating i you know um and it's one of the lost arts you know really of it and i i really yeah i would love for people to start um focusing more on on how they can really take their take their photographs to the next level by beautifying it in that way and taking the same level of care that they do in doing their editing and being able to have something look beautiful online in transferring it onto paper and having that actual thing, the tangible nature of having something on your wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, um, for anybody who's watching that's maybe starting with photography or maybe um, you know they're a little bit more experienced, um, do you have any little gems? I mean, in addition to you know uh, perhaps studying photography, studying the technical aspects, just getting out there and shooting and and kind of developing your eye. Any little gems you can drop um, that you found along your way that might help someone who who is either pursuing uh, photography, whether it's going to be a career or you know a strong passion of theirs that you can kind of pass on. And. I don't know why this came to me because this is not exactly what I would normally say. Um, but the family of man, um, it was an exhibition uh, in the 1950s at the MoMA um, that really showed the universe, like how universal life is, uh, no matter where you are in the world. It was a group show. Um, I just felt like I needed to say that. I'm sure it's going to resonate with somebody and it's going to have that impact for what it needs to be. Um, but I guess also just like looking at other work, look at work and try to assess like how people did it and be afraid to ask questions. Um, if you have the heart and you know what looks good and you already have that natural flair, you know, just, just build on top of that. Um, there's no right or wrong way. I just have my way of doing it. Uh, I like the technical just because it's part of what the way I've been able to integrate photography best. Um, now it's become second nature where I don't necessarily have to think about things. I like talking about it. Uh, but if I look at a photo, if I look at a setting, I can set my settings and I'm normally almost spot on, if not just a little bit off. And that's really just, just practice. Um, so look at what other photographers have done. Uh, try to assess how they did it and try to recreate it and just practice, 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 practice. Um, you know, and it's a, yeah, it's the same old record, but you know, it, it's like, if you don't practice, then you're never going to get it. You're never going to start to understand more. Um, you know, I wish I could say I shoot every single day. I don't shoot every single day, but, uh, I am shooting consistently and constantly and, um, you know, trying to push the limits of my camera and see what I can do or what I can't do and uh, how I can make something look look different. Um, my photography teacher from high school was one of my biggest inspirations, Mr. Ron Lake. And one of the things that he always said was, how can you photograph it differently? You know, so you can take the same exact subject. You can take, you know, you can look at a phone. How many different ways can you photograph it? You know, you can photograph it from this perspective, from this perspective, from this perspective, you can do that angle, that angle, that angle. It's so like, you can look at any one thing. And, you know, by the time, by the time you're done photographing a single thing, you can already have shot it 2000 different ways. And then you decide what makes it look best. You can use a uh, different types of lenses, even. Um, I mean, it's, it's infinite possibilities for everything. And then you just figure out what makes it look the way you want it to look. Um, and that's the most important thing. It's about your own self-expression. So how you want it to look for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to need to wrap the show up, Paul. Um, so we'd like to offer you the closing comments and let us know how we can stay connected with you. Okay. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Really appreciate it. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, you can find me, uh, everything I have is Paul is everywhere, uh, Paul is everywhere .com. Uh, my Instagram at Paul is everywhere. Uh, you can also just plug in Paul is everywhere to Facebook if you want to find my stuff there. Um, if you 
if you are watching here, send me a message. Let me know that you are paying attention. Uh, hold me accountable. I hate social media. So unless you guys tell me that you want me to be posting stuff, I'm pretty lazy about doing it. So please let me know. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Mm. Thank you so much, Paul, for being our guest artist today on Art and Talk and sharing your photography and sharing your insights and, and your journey. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. And much success with with your um, your endeavors and uh, hoping you get to travel, you know, at, at, at the right moment. And I because I know that's a big spark for you and a, a big love for you and and, you know, creating some new things with with your photography. And and I'm sure you're going to come up with some new and exciting things, you know, um, you know, while while you're, you know, here uh, locally as well. So thank you again so much, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching Art and Talk today. And please, again, do stay connected with us on social media, on our YouTube channel, Art and Talk, and also on our Facebook page. And uh, let us know um, what um, artists you would like for us to continue to present. And let us know what, what's going on. And thank you again. And we'll talk soon on the next Art and Talk. Until then, be well and be blessed. <laughs>